Thanks for listening to another life-transforming message from the team here at C3 Southwest Washington. To find out more about our church, visit c3swwa.com. Hey, church family. Many of you already know that Rowena and I will be taking some time off in August, but not to worry. We'll still show up on camera and we'll be enjoying some of the best guest speakers on the planet. Pastor Drew Davies, Pastor Kerry Robertson, Pastor Seth Brooks, and the like. And you can expect our normal Sunday morning live stream on Facebook and YouTube. They will be awesome, as well as our live stream watch parties that you can sign up for online. In our 5.30 p.m. live gathering, these will all be taking place and they will be fantastic. Now that being said, let's dive into our series entitled the best worst. In Genesis chapter 50 verse 20, we read these words. You planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good. Now these are the words expressed by Joseph to his brother some 15 years after they sold him into a human trafficking ring, which led to him becoming a slave in the house of Potiphar, which led to his incarceration. And then through a bizarre twist of events, he found himself before the king, before Pharaoh, to interpret a dream about an upcoming drought. When Pharaoh saw the touch of God on his life and his ability to interpret the dream and the wisdom that he possessed, he placed Joseph in charge of the entire plan to keep the nation from experiencing the famine which then brought him back together with his brothers who now needed food. As they stood before him, they were afraid for their lives. And after all they did to Joseph, they should. But Joseph saw the hand of God in it all. He saw the best in spite of the worst, and he went on to express a profound biblical truth when he said, you planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good. Now our series, The Best Worst, leans into this very idea that God is able to do some of his very best work in our lives during some of the very worst of circumstances. Today I've entitled my message, Safe in the Ark with My Family. It's during this incredibly unusual COVID-19 season, along with political tensions in our nation, that I found myself grabbing onto the Lord like no other time in my life. I've needed him as much as I ever have. But during this time, there have been two incredible gifts helping me to steady myself, to, to keep me focused, to keep me balanced, maybe at moments even sane. Like handrails on a set of really steep stairs, I have relied on the relationships that make up my natural family and my church family, and I have been so appreciative for both. These two sets of relationships have come together over the years and developed sometimes organically and other times very intentionally. You know, this fall, Rowena and I will celebrate 32 years of marriage and we started having kids some 30 years ago. And as we work to build our family, we've always included our children in the building of God's family, the church. 20 some years ago when we were youth pastors and our children were, were really little, I remember we were having a group of students come to the house for some activity, but before they arrived, one of our kids asked, what time are our kids getting here? And you could hear in their voice that they didn't see a separation between what we as parents did and what they did at, as children. We were a family building God's family together. I remember when we moved to Vancouver to pastor that little denominational church on the east side of town, when we lived in a house behind the church building, our kids would go over to the church and help row in a clean during the week. Um, we were too small to be able to afford a custodian and our kids absolutely loved it. And usually at some point they would lay down the cleaning tools and pick up the microphones and start playing church. One would preach, one would lead worship, one would flip the overheads to, to the next verse and maybe even take up the offering. It's probably not a shock that they're still in the mix every single week, talking into microphones, running equipment, helping to direct, and they still love it and we still love it. We get to do this as a family with our church family. And over the years, God has brought many people through the doors. 
They've joined us in the process of following Jesus and that has led them to become members of the church family. Again, some of that has happened organically and some has happened by design. And I certainly don't have time to list off everyone who has been a part of the journey, but some of the original families that were in that little denominational church that have continued to journey with us, it is amazing. People like Pat Hernandez and Ralph and Liz Medina and their kids who are now adults and married with kids of their own. They are some of the greatest gifts to us because we were so different from them and we, we changed everything and yet they're still with us. They are family. I remember a few months in, Rowena decided to host a kids crusade and we put flyers out in the neighborhood. And I remember on the first night meeting a man named Martin Jones and his little boys on the front step. I think I even have a picture on my phone of them standing there, the boys just exploding through the front door, excited to jump in to the action. I also have a picture later on, on the last evening of that crusade, where instead of bobbing for apples in a water bin, uh, Rowena made me bob for hot dogs in a clear plastic tub filled with red jello. And I think I have a picture of that as well. You know, as time has gone by, some young adults began showing up and they were somehow connected to us from years before when we were youth pastors from up north. And some of them looked across the room, they saw one another and that led to weddings and future baby dedication, which led into picnics and camping trips and work projects. And I think during that season about couples like Paige and Heather Ackler or Tyler and Jennifer Davenport, and it just makes me smile at the journey that we've been on together. You know, other great friends joined in from our past, like Saxon and Shannon Williams and Jared and Jennifer Gillahan. They migrated down this way and became a part of the family with their families. And now they play key roles into building and leading God's house. Then you add in key families like Greg and Allison Welter, or Mike and Anna Atchison, Tim and Terry Volts, and the many more who have come and helped to lead the church. It has been absolutely amazing. And it's family. If there's anything that this crazy season has amplified within me, it's the importance of family. Natural family and church family. During the good times, you celebrate life together, you eat food, you have fun, you make fun of one another, you laugh a lot. But because it's real life, and that means there's some dark times during the journey, someone gets sick, someone loses a job, gets into trouble, gets hurt, it's in times like that, that family and church family means everything. And I mean everything. I mean, obviously without the Lord first and foremost, there would be no family, but he brings his tangible life and his help, strength and comfort through the people around us, through what we call family. Honestly, I've loved family during the good times, but I've needed to rely on both of my families during this season. For me, the ground has not felt especially firm at moments. My vision has not been especially clear. Uh, the voices in my head sound sometimes like a, like, like a group of people arguing. My hands have gotten a little bit weary and my emotions, which I can normally ignore through all sorts of difficulties during this season have tried to push me all over the map. But I have been able to find the handrails I've needed in my family, in my church family, and they've been there, steady, strong, supportive, present. It brings to mind the best worst that Noah experienced when we read about his day and we see what was going on. Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 through 12. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. After God revealed to Noah that he was going to flood the earth, he told him in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. And then he went on to say in verses 17 and 18, for behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And it's there that Noah discovered that in the very worst of times, 
God was promising to carry him through, but the promise wasn't just for him. It was for family that was all around him and their families as well. God wasn't just covenanting with Noah. He was covenanting with those that Noah had covenants with. It's the mirror image of family and church family for the day and age in which we live. And sure enough, the day came when worst showed up at the front door of Noah's life. Genesis 7 verses 11 through 13. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. And worst stuck around for a while. Genesis 7:24, and the waters prevailed on the earth. But over a period of time, finally worse subsided and God began to lead these families into best. Genesis chapter 8, verse 14 through 16. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. And God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Now it's an amazing snapshot of families together, following the Lord as the Lord led them through dark and difficult times. And he was able to do this because of who they were together and what they had built together. And as a result, all of them were saved. Now, one of the greatest parts of our journey together and navigating through life's highs and lows was the day that we found our tribe, the C3 family. You know, we were prior to that an independent church, not because we wanted to be, but because we just couldn't find something to be a part of. That's something that would be the bigger version of us. We longed for a family, not a franchise, not a denomination, but a family that looked somewhat like us, that thought like us, that valued things that we valued. We were in search of our tribe. And then about six or seven years ago, we were introduced to the C3 family led by Pastors Phil and Chris Pringle. Amazing people, amazing leaders, started their church back in the 80s in Australia that has since become a global family, having now planted some 600 churches around the world. And I can remember the very first time I walked into one of their pastor's gatherings. I was captivated, I was moved, I felt God's presence. It was exciting. I, I actually felt like I was home. And our leaders in our local church had a similar experience over the next few years. And we built relationships with some of the C3 churches and pastors and become a part of the outreaches, church planting, and it has been amazing. In January of 2019, we were officially welcomed into the C3 family. And we are so excited about what that means for our present and our future our good times, and honestly, the strength that we'll find while navigating maybe some of life's future storms together as a local family and a global family. Well, this year, C3 Global, believe it or not, is celebrating 40 years, 40. Believe it or not, the original leadership team, the Pringles, the McIntyres, the Kelseys, they are all still together, a little bit older, doing life, celebrating, still building, and likely still navigating some of life's storms, still leading the church. And as part of their 40 year anniversary, they've created the following video, which is one of two in a series. And I think that this will help you to appreciate really the depth or what you, of what you are a part of. You will absolutely appreciate and enjoy this. So sit back and take it all in. dream and a heart and a little bit of money in our pocket right. that got us over to Sydney. Exactly. Right. And there's a backstory to that, but we're going to start cooking. We are going to start cooking. 
Because you tried to go to Sydney twice, didn't you? We did, before that. And, and then and both the... times Phil found out where you'd gone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was pregnant with Daniel. It was 1975. Um, the, the, the real, the first moment we heard about Sydney, where it went into Phil's heart, we were in the 48 Oxford Terrace on, one, on our Monday night house church. And Alan, uh, an elder in the church, had a son who had a church in Sydney and we were just, it was filled with all hippies and it was packed, the, the house that we were running. And Alan said to Phil, um, we need a church like this in Sydney. With Sydney, we'd never even thought of Sydney as a place and went into Phil's heart, Sydney. Okay, and that was 1971. Remember Phil? We had that Taramara outreach and people got saved. People that we know today got saved yeah, but, in that. But uh, even though we had big success, it was not the right time. Yeah. So we went back to New Zealand. It was awful. We were just, Phil was down. He's like, I've missed the call. I'm just going to Took up painting, about. gave up the ministry. We so We Sydney. gave it up. Never thought oh, we'd be, listen. never thought we'd come Dead. there again. Gone. I got a job as a postman. Yep. Uh, and uh, <laughs> delivering messages to people, which I guess <laughs> still I still am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. She's still a person. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> so is Simon. Uh, we do we know there. how to deliver? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Like a postman, we always oh, deliver. Yeah. Describe that day when you were out on the post run and the oh, Lord well. spoke to you about Yeah, Lewiston. I was. I I'm pretty well could take you there today, actually, because it was like such a relief to hear a vo the voice of God. I was just so happy because I'd been so discouraged. And I felt broken, actually. It felt like I just didn't have any strength to get up and do much at all. So he spoke to me, he said, go start a church in Littleton. But I was just out. glad to know that I was still called. We went out there, nothing much happened over the three years we were there. The 30 people pretty much remained the same. 30, I think we went from about 15 to 30 people. Yeah, but we had some amazing salvations. But yeah, but, but uh, after two years two of being there, I went on a trip to India. And on the way through, stopped in Sydney. Uh, the plane touched down in Sydney. And God said to me on the way there, now's the time. And you said to us, Chris and I are finally have got the go to go to Sydney. And so our response was, you know, well, we're sad to see you go. That was it. You know, I mean, what am I going to say? But then during the worship, uh, and that was a day when I actually was worshipping, instead of thinking about something. Um, I heard the Lord speak to me, and I, this is, I've never heard this since, and it had no promise to it. It was five words, and you are going to. Isn't that Clear as crystal. Yeah. So as we were driving home, I said to Helen, um, I feel the Lord spoke to me. And as soon as I said it, she said, got it. So we said, why don't we fast? And we looked and said, why would we bother fasting? Right. You knew. We knew. And then we went to Phil and Chris. And uh, that, was, that, was, that was really, it was very sobering because they said, thrilled, but you have to come on your own steam. We don't have like a missions organization. No, we said, no problem. Yeah, we, 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 we had nobody Nothing. actually no. giving us money or no. setting us up or Nothing. no interest nights. So Simon, <laughs> um, you and Phil arrived in Sydney first and then Helly and I and the kids arrived maybe a couple of weeks later. Literally. You, guys, you got jobs. And our whole family went and stayed on Simon's yep. and Helen's floor. Yep. We lived there for maybe four in weeks. St. Ives. Yep. Lives. It was an adventure. We hired off the Catholic church, the hall they had across the road in Oaks Avenue. And on the first, uh, we just went, took all our meeting down there. And then Mark and Bernie. That's when we They walked, walked in that night. Now, your sister had had an influence in you, hadn't she? she yeah, our, my sister had led us to the Lord. And then we were on a break up at Noosa. We went to the Assemblies of God Church in Noosa and ran into this guy called Chris Chetwin Jones. I know, yeah, I remember oh who was gosh, Who was yes. from Bulgola. Yeah, yeah. And he said, there's a new church starting yeah. on the Northern Beaches area. And we lived in Colorado. Right. And, and you know, there's no mobile phone. It's right. like no Google. Yeah. No, no. Nothing. So he old. said, I'll call you when we get back to Sydney and let you know. We called him and called him. We, never, we could never get him. And right. one Sunday afternoon, I said to my I don't know, mate, we just gotta, we've just gotta go to church, so we'll just go anywhere. Right. And Mark said, let me just try him one more time. And he picked up. <laughs> oh. 
And so we jumped. I said he the said surf a DY the surf, surf club. Right. Six o'clock. Mm. Right. Sunday night, and it was ten to six. Right. <laughs> So we jumped in the car, drove down the car park, you know, the story. And, what uh, did tell us? Tell so I drove into the car park and it was all dark pitch. and we thought, What's that? Mate, Why we got it? the details wrong. What yeah. happened? You know, and we only just had that thought and that mentioned to each other. And then a guy comes flying into the parking lot. I remember very clearly in his turquoise green Ford Cortina. Yes. And, and it was Paul O'Connell. <laughs> and I remember he just waving his hand out of the thing. And he didn't get out of the car, he just sort of screamed out the window. Yeah. And said, are you guys looking for the church? We went, yeah, he says, follow me. <laughs> We've moved. <laughs> and that we followed night. him up the road. Yeah. And of course, you had apparently had said to yeah, Paul. Yeah, I said, I said to yeah. Paul, go back down, because there be, might be somebody looking for us. Yeah. So and good. we don't know oh, wow. where they are. So it, it's incredible little oh. hinges yeah. that huge doors oh. swing on, swing right? Up. And then so we, we followed him up, walked into the back of the Catholic school hall. You know, very clearly, it sounds a bit cliche and corny, but we and squeezed each other's like hands that. and we said, we're home. Because we didn't know to say that. Mm. Like that was yeah, just the exact was. feeling that we felt. Yeah. We looked at, at each other and we like, we're home. We're, we're really home. People they, find their place. Yeah, they come it all over the yeah. world. We create we're home. the atmosphere, the culture yeah. of the presence of God and then people come in and, and they do say it. People come up to all of us yeah. all the time mm -hmm. and say, I'm home. Do you know what? Those two words are the nucleus of everything that we are all these years later, 40 years later. People they, find their place. Yeah, One of the things that people um, are wondering about is um, people look at the team that we've had for 40 years and say, so well, how in the world do you do that? That's a good point. And um, what do you think? The, well, the length of time. Uh, one thing I think is this. Mm. We actually became each other's family. In some ways we were forced to, which helped us. I think eating together, holidaying together, I think those things. We no, part of the picture. Because we did a lot of holiday. And we showed up at the beach every Monday together with the kiddies. I think with, amongst us, the capacity to be friends and still have respect and honour for how God has positioned us yeah. and led us. Yeah. You guys have always been honouring of Chris and I uh, in the recognition of that leadership. Mm -hmm. And yet we've, we can still do life together. So this one of the things that um, I, I guess we all are as pioneers, but we haven't thought about it, have we? I would never see myself as a pioneer, right. but we obviously are. Right. Uh, I think in C3 has pioneered a bunch of things. We're the first church in Australia to record live praise and worship. Yep. Yes. And uh, we, uh, I'm not sure if we're the first, but certainly we were amongst the first, maybe in the world of churches to have a school of creative arts. Totally. Where we promoted arts, drama, film and video, painting, yeah. all these things, because they were kind of like re regarded at worst as something that was of the flesh, soulish and sinful, and at best something that was tolerated by, and they were the weird crowd in, in a church. And well, I think that pioneering thing in you was the genesis of, of pioneering, you know, church planting everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, church planning wasn't even a thing. It wasn't a thing. No, well, no, God, no, no, no. The, the pioneering thing, I, I don't know, if, you know how much credit you can really take. And, well, I certainly don't feel like that. I'm just doing what I, I got told to do. Go plant 10 churches in 10 major cities around the world. He confirmed it. He said, look at this, Decapolis, 10 cities. I remember that. Ooh, I, remember, I remember that conversation. And so we went and did that, sent these guys out all around the world. Mm. And within four years, Mm -hmm. At 10 churches in 10 major cities. Yeah, what it was, next? It's astonishing. <laughs> exactly. I think like what listeners need to remember is all those major moves forward were done on the back of prayer and fasting. Mm. Together. That's exactly mm. right. Like it wasn't just, oh, this is a good idea. What yep. do you reckon? It yep. was, we sought God sure. and, and the Holy Spirit fell and it seemed right to all of us. Yeah. And if ever yes. one of us has said, I feel like doing this and the whole has said, mm, we don't do it. Right. Not even you. No, I wouldn't. You know? I think also that if you're going to pioneer, everybody has to be prepared to do anything. And that's a big part of our team. You, I mean, we've all been the children's church leader. We, this guy was our administrator uh, for a while. I kept uh, on going up to my point of incompetence, <laughs> <laughs> moving sideways and going doing something else. I mean, you've been the Bible college, you've been a leader. Children's church, children's Bible church. college, pastor, pastor of the pastors. 
overseer of uh, Europe. Uh, yeah. So, and some of the moves could appear like not always an upward trajectory. Some of them are like sideways. Some of them could appear even going sideways and down. And uh, it, it, and yet it's not the position or the title. It's the, because we've got the relationship with think whatever needs to be done, whatever I need to be, I'll be there. And the ability to change gears uh, for that, I think, creates an A team. I remember years ago, I think we have somebody was talking about this and I think the comment came out that uh, I think it was in my, my case this time, but it was probably for all of us. My gift is to do what needs to be done. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's, people say, what's your spiritual gift? Uh, to do what needs to be done. <laughs> that's great. So if I have to lead, I'll lead. Yeah. It might not be my spiritual gift, but I have to do it. Yeah. And that's, that's that principle that we were living before we sort of heard about it. Uh, the team you're in. Yes. It's more important than the team you lead. Yeah. What are the biggest risks we've taken? Oh, for us, it was definitely leaving the shores of... Going and planning that first two. Very much into the unknown. I think that we're so full of vision mm. uh, and so happy and keen. Or yeah. Healthy. I think that a, a healthy measure of naivety was good because it actually got us there. Yeah. But then when we faced it, when you got there, you realised how much of a risk it was. I think also, you know, I, the relationship uh, calms down the level of risk because you, I knew and hopefully you knew that if anything went skew with, we'd be there for you. Oh, no, we definitely knew that. And so that has yep. got to be more valuable yes. than an organisation that is just, you know, saying, here's some resources on your way. Because if there is no heartfelt relationship, we would, there would be no way on earth we'd let you uh, suffer. And we've had people that I've called back out of their position because they are struggling. They're yeah. suffering and the kids are suffering. Yeah. Yeah. We just yeah. Yeah. come back. Come, come back. back. What about you, Simon? Uh, it's, it's, it's an, I, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I, I, I would probably say buying a house. Yeah. Because all the rest of it just seemed like fun. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, going to England seemed like, whoopee do. Going to Australia, well, fantastic. So I would say, so strangely, I'd say buying a house. So you saw all of that stuff as adventure rather yeah, than risk. Yeah, I still do. Yeah. It's a great adventure. Yeah. It's awfully costly, yeah. but a wonderful adventure. So yeah, I, it is. So strangely, I'd say my first house was my most nervy risk moment. Yeah. Looking back, you, you can calculate risk more so than looking forward. And I would say uh, yeah. the children factor, taking children with you on the journey, it's a risk that you've got to constantly mollify by giving attention to them in other ways that you can't as normal parents would do. I mean, you never have a Sunday off. But I think that's what kept us going because we were doing that together, yeah. our kids together, yeah. you know. Our fruitfulness together is always going to be greater than our fruitfulness on our own. Oh. You'll make any sacrifice to yeah. keep that that unity and that spirit of friendship yeah. alive. And when you realise that your destiny is together, yeah. like it isn't just for a little bit of life, a couple of years, but it's actually, you've been called together. That yeah. it's a respect for God saying, he called us together, so we better make yeah. this work. Because out of that, it's gonna come fruitfulness that yeah. is beyond our imagination. And I think even now we're, in a, we're at the end of a compounding, effort yes. that has been together and it'll get easier with more flourishing and more fruitfulness that'll come out of the fruit that we've already yep. you know, seen. And we're right now we're seeing it, we're like there have been ter there have been sacrifices and terrible tears and heartache within our families for whatever reasons, sickness or whatever, trials with kids and now we are seeing the, 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 the turning of that page exactly. where we're seeing the sacrifice that we made and our kids. They are now picking up the gauntlet and saying, we're running with you. Yeah. Mum and Dad, we're running with you. Sure. And, and I just think that's... That's the greatest joy, isn't it? You've greatest it, joy. But you've had to, we've had to get through all that mucky but that's stuff. that's blood, sweat and tears. Yeah, yeah. That, that has happened. Yeah. And now we're just entering into a new season. We're going to be celebrating 40 years. And for me personally, I think, for me, like the risk or whatever in the future will be to keep growing and to take the risk of what God is asking us to do into our future. Mm -hmm.
Phil and I and all of us, like we're trusting you, Lord, that you've got our back and we are, we're still pioneers, you know, and I mean, that's a pretty dangerous thing to say to the Lord. We're still pioneers, send us wherever, but that's, that's the risk we take as sure. servants of the Lord and I'm happy to do it. Wow, how amazing was that? And these are our leaders. And as goes the leader, so goes the family. And that is one of the reasons we have such an amazing family here at C3 Church in Southwest Washington. Now, if you're listening and you long to be a part of a family like that or a family like this, maybe your natural family has fallen short or maybe you haven't had a great church experience, I want you to know that it all starts by becoming a part of God's family. You know, Jesus came to make that possible. He paid a very high price for your adoption into the family of God, but all you need to do is say yes to that payment and you're in. It, it really is that easy and it will position you to become a part of the local and then the global church, to build maybe with us and to strive to build the family of God here in the Southwest Washington area and beyond. So let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for each person listening. Thank you for those who might be listening who have yet to start a relationship with you. So right now, Jesus, we say yes to you. Not just adding you to our lives, but we say yes to following you, to walking away from our lives, to find the life that you have for us. And it's probably in the same trajectory, but Lord, you wanna refine it and lead us into our best life. And so right now, as we pray together, we say yes. We say yes to you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And Lord, I pray for everyone else who's listening. I pray that this season really magnifies the need to really, maybe not just organically, but intentionally to press into relationships, to press into family, to enjoy family when the times are good so that those relational bonds will be strong in difficult seasons. Lord, I pray for the same thing for us as a church family, to, to, to not only build organically, but also to build intentionally, to call people up, to spend time with one another, to build life together so that we can enjoy life, but also so that when times are tough, we have handrails to grab onto. Lord, help us to be mindful that there are others that don't have family like that and to invite them into the family of God and into our local family by design. It's in Jesus' name I pray that you will give us success. Amen and amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, leaders, and what we do at C3 Church, visit our website at c3swwa.com.